Good morning, church. Welcome to our Global Outreach Faith Promise Sunday. For those of you that are here, uh, you'll see that there is a card on your chair. For those of you that are joining us through live stream, we'll be talking in just a moment about how you can be a part of this and see what's going on. So just hang on just a minute with the card. We would be amiss if we did not take a moment and offer a prayer this morning to our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Let's just take a moment. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Father God, we know that there is so much information going on. There's so much activity. Things are just a mess. But Lord, we know that when we don't seem to see an answer, we know that you are the answer. Because this morning we want to proclaim that Jesus is the answer for the world today. And so we want to lift up the Ukraine, we want to lift up its people, we want to lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ that are there being compassionate and loving. And so, Father God, we ask for your grace and mercy and intervention. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Fairview Village Church is a global church. Pastor Dave Bennett is not here this morning because he is leading a group of Fairview Villagers in Israel right now. And it was exciting that 16 out of that group of about 20 were baptized in the Jordan River this past week. Isn't that great? What a great experience. We also, next month, are going to be uh, sending, uh, deploying a group of 11 people back to the Dominican Republic. And so that is our next work and witness trip here at Fairview Village. That is March 19th through the 27th. And I've asked Bruce Beatty, our work and witness coordinator, to just give us a little bit of information this morning so that we can be informed to pray, to encourage, and to support. Bruce, what is gonna be happening during this work and witness trip this year in the Dominican? We're gonna be going back to Rancho Reba, which is a project that Fairview uh, Village took on a number of years ago. We're gonna be helping to do some work to reconfigure some of the space to make it more usable for them in the Child Development Center. This is part of the Great Commission where we go out into the world to help make it possible to evangelize and to teach about the love of Jesus. So with the Child Development Center, we'll be doing projects to reconfigure, remodel, do some repairs, and really equip them to come out of this COVID, time of COVID period when their service has really been greatly diminished and reduced in terms of what they could do and to prepare them to come out of COVID to go back and be really engaging with the community and growing it there. Is there something specific that our congregation could be praying for to kind of narrow the focus here for this? Well, certainly I think, you know, the safety and the health of all the team mm -hmm. members that are going, um, but also for that community um, where they haven't, um, they've had a hard time from COVID and to be able to see the um, love that we would bring back into that community and encourage them to become more engaged with the church and to, to restart things there. Wonderful, that's excellent. And today on your way out, there are baskets on the tables marked Work and Witness Dominican Republic. If you would like to give specifically to this project just for some additional resources and supplies as they go, as they minister, as they do vacation Bible school, as they work on this remodel construction project, those baskets are available to you at the end of the service. If you're joining us on live stream, you can use our giving app or the uh, information on the website under giving and you can mark your gift work and witness. We really do appreciate what you're doing, Bruce, the time and energy that you've put into this, and we'll be praying for you and the group of 10 that represent us, the Fairview Village family, in the Dominican Republic next month. Uh, let's just uh, praise the Lord by a round of applause for this trip that's coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, today, like I said, is Faith Promise Global Outreach Sunday, and it is exciting to have in-house here, uh, a family with us who has represented our church and our sister churches around the world in Spain, in Romania, specifically the Trans Transylvania region, so Transylvania, Pennsylvania, that's kind of cool, and then uh, in Romania. 
And then Justin, in just a few months, they're going to be deployed to Italy. But I'm going to let them share that with you. I'm also going to invite right now uh, Joshua Herndon, our uh, missionary, our global minist- uh, missionary in the Church of the Nazarene. And he is going to come this morning and uh, probably introduce his family real quick and, uh, and then share with us what is happening in Europe in the uh, ministry and in the Church of the Nazarene. So let's give Josh and his family a great Fairview Village welcome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, a lot has changed for my family since the last time we were home. We've had many members of our family join us on the mission field. Well, they haven't joined us. They're not like with us. I, I mean, they're with us. They're not dead. Uh, I'll start over. Um, <laughs> We've had members of our family who have also become missionaries with the Church of the Nazarene. My in-laws started off in the country of Sri Lanka, which was quite a distance from us living in Romania. Uh, So this story had a great beginning. Uh, But then they located to the country just south of us, to the country of Bulgaria. And that's what we call a plot twist or a crisis moment in our narrative. Um, They became uh, missionaries there. My mother-in-law was invited to attend a wedding back in the United States. She left, and that is the weekend that the pandemic hit and quarantine happened. She was trapped over here in the U.S. while her husband was over there in Bulgaria, 6,300 miles away for months and months, which is what happens when Shannon's dad and I pray the same prayer. It was... um, a long time being away from each other. I can only imagine that for my father-in-law, it just wasn't long enough. The result of this is that they have since retired from the mission field. So now what used to be a six-hour drive for us is back to being a 15-hour flight. I tell you that to let you know that in the world, missions is improving. Um, My sister and her husband have also become missionaries with the Church of the Nazarene. They were serving in Equatorial Guinea, and if you don't know where that is, that's okay. They don't know either. Um, They have unfortunately also decided to move much closer to us, so they are relocating from Africa to Europe. Um, I don't want to give the wrong impression. It's not that we don't want our family near us. Uh, It's just, um, well, no, that's it. Um, They will now be a 12-hour drive from where we will be moving to in Italy, um, and halfway for both of us is a Swiss chocolate factory. So now instead of pretending to be happy to see each other, Uh, we'll have something that will actually uh, make us happy. Uh, Outside of here, we have a table with some things for you to take a look at, things from the country that we have been calling home in Romania, and then also things from the place that we will soon be calling home in Italy. Uh, So if you've never seen or touched anything from Transylvania, feel free to do so. Um, Vampiric viruses are nothing compared to COVID-19. And it's quite possible those items have both. Uh... So one of those viruses will help you live forever. Uh, the other one, well, just, just choose, uh, choose wisely. Um, on that table, we have some things that we're selling, dolls that are being made from our Nazarene sisters in Sigmaju, Romania. I will be telling some of the stories from up there. Uh, we also have some bags that are painted by girls who are part of our safe house for survivors of human trafficking in Bucharest, Romania, those are out also out there on the table. Uh, we also have prayer cards. So if you love to pray for your missionaries, let me rephrase. If you like to pray for your missionaries, I'll start again. If you pray for your mission, if you know that you should pray for your missionaries, feel free to grab one of these cards that are out there on the table. Um, it's a celebration of our daughter leaving us. She's going to be staying here and attending university. So she will not be a part of our mission journey moving forward. And we have a picture that is, um, shows us celebrating Uh, That fact, she'll be out there. Uh, You can feel free to talk to her. Grab one of these cards, put it wherever you're going to see it. Remember it. Uh, Put it on a table. Put it into your Bible. Tack it to your fridge. Um, Tape it to the back of your toilet lid so we're all uncomfortable. Just um, just put it somewhere where uh, where you're going to remember. Okay, enough of this nonsense. Let's talk about me. Um, The beard is a fairly new thing for me. I started growing it when we were serving in Greece. Um, Our pipes burst in town, and I decided I want to try something new. Um, With the pandemic, we weren't going anywhere, and so I decided to just let it grow this time. Um, I wanted my face to reflect my downward spiral into cabin fever lore, and um, I was losing it, I'll be honest. And contrary to Nazarene gossip, I was not before the pandemic. Finally, we were released from our prison homes, 
And I started to realize that the beard gave me powers that I never had before. I noticed that people started coming up to me on the street, confessing their sins as they do the bearded Orthodox priests that are there. Well, okay, not exactly, but I can tell that they wanted to. It's, the problem is I just have a face that says, no thanks, I'm not interested. Um, I also noticed that the guys who were interested in my daughter before the pandemic were all of a sudden terrified of me. So yeah, I was keeping it. Um, but I really started to notice the way that children started to treat me differently. We went to, um, to Open Door, uh, the safe house for survivors of human trafficking. And if we can pop up a couple of these slides as I move forward. Um, the children that are there, I, we just wanted to see how, how the women were doing, how the children were doing, making sure that they were all OK. The child here in the middle, he began to make his way up to me. With his head down, he was kind of slowly shuffling his feet, creeping to me the same way that my mother-in-law does at 6 in the morning when she comes to visit us. And he just stares up and looks at me. And I knew that he knew me or that he should know me. Either way, he shouldn't have wanted to kill me. And he starts whispering something to me, and I don't hear a word he's saying. Now, nothing gives me greater joy than pretending that I don't hear what a small child is saying to me. I mean, they're little. They rarely say anything of value. But I ignore my instincts, and I ask him what he's trying to say. And he whispers again, and I still don't hear him. So I get down on my knees to his level and get eye to eye with this shy little beast and ask him again what he's trying to say. And he says, yes, mosh krachun? Are you old man Christmas? <laughs> so as I start drafting a letter to the real Santa about how this kid deserves absolutely nothing, he starts to move into the wish list portion of this visit. He says that he wants a drone, nothing big, um, nothing fancy, nothing expensive, just something that he can fly around the safe house. The same safe house filled with 15 women, three infants, and five small children. Now, nothing gives me greater joy than giving a kid a gift that will make everyone around him miserable, but I decided against it. I hope he's enjoying that priceless piece of coal instead. I mean, any kid his age can do just as much damage with that. So, you know, when I look at these kids, when I look at their moms, when I look at the people that our church is ministered to, I think about how the pandemic has affected them differently. How some of them have thrived during this time of limited contact and others like me have struggled. They have tried to be the hands and feet of Jesus in their local communities. But they've also seen the pain and anguish of those that have, that have been negatively affected by all of this. I want to tell you some of their stories. I want to tell you about some of our, of our old stories, and I want to tell you some of our new stories and, and, and show you how our old stories look a lot like our new ones. I want to show you where we've seen God working, but in places where we also need to see him work. More importantly, I want to introduce you to members of our family, members of your family, the family of God. I want to show you what faith promise does the lives that are changed because of your faithful giving. I want you to know that these stories are not my stories, that these stories are your stories. These are faith promise stories, stories and lives that have been affected by the gospel because you decided to give. I want to tell you the story of Anka in the town of Tsigmandru, Romania. We have a children's program there where children of the community come together twice a week. There they sing songs and they hear a Bible story, they make a craft and they eat a meal. Now these kids, they sing songs at home but they're not good songs and they hear stories at home but they're not good stories. They make things at home but usually things with, that, are, that are made with dirty and broken things. And they rarely eat a meal at home which means when they do come to our church, this is probably the only meal that they're going to eat that day. See, Mandra is a Roma community made up mostly of gypsies, and it's a poor and transient community. A lot of the men from this town travel to other parts of Europe to find work. And this wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if they would just come home once they've earned their money, but they don't. They often stay and start second families where they're working, leaving their wives home alone to care for the children. Now, I don't want to put the wrong image of your mind of a professional woman in her 20s or 30s who takes care of the house and takes care of the children. Most of these moms that I'm talking about are in their teens and not their late teens. 
Anka started coming to our church when she had just turned 10. She had heard about all the things that the church does from other children in the community. She had heard about the songs they sing and the stories they hear, the, the crafts they make and the food they eat, and she was excited to come. But let's be honest, it wasn't too hard to get her to come because of what she was dealing with at home. You see, life at home was a little different for Anka. She was the servant of the house. Her job was to wash all of the clothes and she had to wash them by hand. With no running water inside the house and little to no electricity, it meant taking all of the family's clothes down to the field runoff creek, wading in and washing them by hand in whatever filth was down there in the cold, frigid Transylvanian winters. The problem is that once the washing was done, there was cooking to be done. And after the cooking was done, there was cleaning to be done. And after the cleaning was done, there were siblings to be raised. And after the siblings were cared for, there was a beating to be had. Because somewhere along the line between the washing and the cooking and the cleaning and the raising of her other siblings, something just didn't match up to mom's satisfaction. But when she entered that church, she was able to be a 10-year-old again. She was able to sing praises to a God who loves her. She was able to hear stories about a Jesus who healed those around him. She was able to make a craft and sneak it into her house as a reminder that she had a Christian family who loved and cared and prayed for her. And she was able to scarf down a bowl of soup and a sandwich, something that she knew would never be waiting for her at home. And all of a sudden, a worldwide pandemic would close that door. Now, the chores would continue, obviously. A pandemic doesn't stop that. And the beatings would continue, obviously. A pandemic doesn't slow that down. But constant contact with people who loved her and cared for her and prayed over her, yeah, that would have to stop. Not forever, but long enough. You know, when I think about Anka, I picture her around the table with the disciples in the upper room after the crucifixion of Christ. And there they sit, wondering. Things had been so good. They'd had all this time with the Son of God. And now, all of a sudden, it's over. I picture her sitting there with them, with the questions swirling around in her mind. Is this really all there is? And I think that don't they realize that Sunday is coming? Don't they realize that dawn is breaking? Don't they realize that Jesus can't be contained? That he is walking this way? That he is standing right outside the door? And Anka, like the disciples, realized that it's not that the story is over. It's just that a new chapter is starting. I want to tell you that you are a part of that new chapter in Anka's life. You are the reason why we have a children's ministry there in Sigmaju, Romania. You are the reason why she is able to sing those songs and hear those stories and make those crafts and eat that meal. You are the reason because of your faithful giving that our brothers and sisters in Transylvania are able to minister to the children who come into that church. You are the reason that we are able to minister to Anka. I had to think about her. Because of the pandemic, she no longer had the watchful eyes of those inside the church. Anka feels like she has no hope and becomes like many of those young Roma girls who feel like they don't have an option. At the age of 11, she marries. And at almost 12 years of age now, she is a mother. Anka, a girl who used to come to our children's program will now be coming back to the church as part of our mothers and babies program. Still being ministered to, just in a much different, a more depressing way. You know, but for every story like Anka's, we have a Betty. Now, Betty is a, not like a lot of the other girls that we come into contact with. Betty came from a two-parent home. It didn't help much. Her father was an alcoholic, and he was a violent drunk at that. At the age of 11, Betty sees her mother packing a suitcase and gets all excited because they're, they're going on a trip, and she asks her mom, where are we going? And her mom says, you are not going anywhere. 
I'm going and you're staying. I just can't take this anymore. And little 11-year-old Betty, she doesn't understand why mom gets to leave this abusive household, but she has to stay. It doesn't take long for dad to bring in a new girlfriend, and it doesn't take long for Betsy to realize that this is going to be a fairy tale, just the wrong kind. You see, dad's new girlfriend is a storybook wicked stepmother. As she turns 14, Betsy is now old enough to take on all of the responsibilities in the home. She comes home from school and she notices that there's a small stool there by the front door. She wonders what it's for and soon she finds out. When she comes home from school, she needs to take off her backpack and set it by the door. And then she needs to get on her knees facing the stool. It's at that time that dad's girlfriend comes in and forces Betty to wash her feet, take off her shoes. And then she pushes her feet against Betty's head and screams in her ear, do you obey me? For four straight years. When she's 18, Betty is finally able to work outside the house and man, is she excited to get out of there. But someone immediately begins to take note of her at her work. Noting how childlike and simple she is, he begins to try to remove her from her family and what's going on at home doesn't make this too difficult of a task. Once she's separated, she realizes that she has become the victim of human trafficking. Her trafficker begins to sell her to other people. Betsy's not like a lot of our other girls, though. She has a fight in her. And she begins to fight back, but it doesn't take long to see what the punishment is going to be. Her trafficker lives right by a self-serve car wash. He takes her out there in the month of January and begins to pour water onto the concrete slab, allowing it to freeze, and then forces Betty to sleep out there for the entire month. She becomes horribly ill. And word starts to get back to her dad, and so he comes to pick her up, and she believes that she is finally saved until dad drags her back home and locks her in a room, never allowing her to leave. She's able to get out one day and places a call into the police. But as they begin to talk to her, she begins to weep. When they ask her where she can go, she can't go. She can't leave. And that's when Open Door, our Bucharest ministry, our safe house for survivors of human trafficking, gets the call. And Betty comes to our house. It soon found out that other girls like Betty were also being trafficked there. Betty's best friend was one of those girls. But she's not ready to come to our safe house. She wants to try to make it on her own. But Betty, she is warm and she is safe and she is fed. But before her trafficker is caught and arrested, he finds Betty's best friend and kills her. Betty comes to know who Jesus is in that house. As she joins the Bible study there, led by one of our other survivors, Kati, she is able to hear the good story of who Jesus is. She decides that she wants to announce her faith publicly through the, uh, through the act of baptism in our local Nazarene church there in Bucharest. You know, when I think of Betty... I see her on the shore of the sea with the rest of the Israelites. After years of suffering through slavery, both in home and in a foreign land, they are finally free. But as they get out there, they see certain death in front of them and the enemy pursuing them from behind. And there absolutely seems to be no hope. The parting of the sea and the walk on dry land is not near as miraculous for Betty as it was for the Israelites, but please don't believe that it is any less important. With her trafficker behind bars, Betty sings praises to the God who rescued her, the same God who rescued those Israelites so many years ago. That same God is rescuing slaves today. You are a part of Betty's story the place where she goes every Sunday to sing praises to the God who rescued, their, who rescued her is there because of you. The seat that she sits in, the songs that she sings, the people that she is surrounded by are there because of you. Your involvement in Faith Promise, your giving to the World Evangelism Fund makes the work that we do there possible. Betty's story 
is your story. I want to tell you quickly about Tamea, back up in Sigmandru. Tamea's life is a difficult one, a long heritage there. Tamea's mom was also a child bride. At 12, marrying her 14-year-old boyfriend, and immediately she becomes pregnant. But she wants to do what other children are doing. It's her responsibility to take care of the house, even as a small 12-year-old boy. And the son that she gave birth to is Tamea's older brother. But she longs to do what the other children are doing. But she has a responsibility now. It's cold, as it often is in Transylvania. And she at least knows that she needs to keep her baby warm. With no floor to speak of and very thin walls, it's almost as cold on the inside as it is on the outside. So she makes a fire in the little iron stove and sets her baby in front of it and runs off to watch the boys play soccer in the field. The problem is Tamea's mom didn't make sure that the fire was lit. She comes back to find her baby frozen on the floor. This is Tamea's heritage. Her mother ended up having 12 children, over 20 abortions, and didn't stick around to take care of Tamea. But Tamea comes to our church, to our children's program. She sings the songs. She hears the stories. She makes the craft. She eats her meal. And then she goes back to her home that is absolutely covered in walnuts, where she is forced to search for in the bear-infested woods every single weekend. Then a pandemic. Without the watchful eyes of those inside the church, without those caring for her, Tamea becomes her mother. 11-year-old girl, married off to her 14-year-old boyfriend, and almost immediately she becomes pregnant. And with the arrival of the baby comes the arrival of the abuse by her adolescent groom. Tamea now lives in a property that is owned by the church, where she is watched over and made sure that she is protected there. Just like Anka, she can see the family of God down that dirt road and look inside the little white gate that is there. And she knows that there is a family that loves her that cares for her. When I think about Tamea, I think about her in the belly of the fish with Jonah, wondering how she got there, a victim of lost opportunities and ignored advice, forgetting about the faithfulness of God, reliving the life of her mother, and there she sits, wondering if she will ever get a second chance. But I'm here to tell you she will. Tamea will have that opportunity to once again hear about the story of the man inside the fish and she will know exactly what he is feeling. But more importantly, she will hear the story about the one who spent three days and three nights in the belly of the earth and who raised again to give her new life, a life that she desperately needs and a hope that she is searching for. You are the reason why Tamea will get to hear those stories again. You are the reason why Tamea will continue to be loved while she will once again sing those praises and hear those stories. She will also be joining us in our Mothers and Babies program. And because of your faithful giving, not only will you be helping to take care of her, but you will be able to help take care of her new responsibility as well. But for every Tamea, we have a Roberta. Roberta came to us as a 14-year-old. She had been trafficked at that age. Not only was she abused by her trafficker, but by all the men in that family, the trafficker's two brothers, his father, his grandfather, and his uncle, all of them abused him. Then when they were done, sold her to other men. Roberta, during this time, was forced to get two abortions. Gets pregnant a third time, and the trafficker is furious with her. He decides that he's going to do anything he can to make her lose that baby. 
So he takes her out into the cold winter outside and begins to dump cold buckets of water on her head, then runs back inside and watches from the window. But Roberta keeps going, as does the baby inside of her. When that doesn't work, he calls up 10 of his friends to come over and abuse Roberta for 48 hours straight. But Roberta keeps going, as does the baby inside of her. When that doesn't work, he begins to push her up against furniture into the corners, leaving marks on her body that exist to this day. But Roberta keeps going, as does the baby inside of her. She tries to escape, and the sister of the trafficker grabs her by her hair, drags her back inside where they tie her to a chair for two days. No food, no water, no bathroom breaks. But Roberta keeps going, as does the baby inside of her. Finally, the baby is born but she gets no relief. Forced to work out in the fields during the day, her trafficker drives her to clients at night. She comes home from working in the fields and notices that her baby is bleeding from the mouth. She asks what happened. The trafficker says that the baby rolled out of bed. He's six weeks old, she says. He can't move, he can't roll out or get out of bed. I need to take him to the hospital. Well then take him to the hospital, the trafficker scoffs. The first time that she's able to leave that house with her baby in hand. And it is obvious from everyone in the hospital that they are victims of human trafficking. Both of them are admitted to the hospital. But only one of them is released. It's found that Roberta's baby has a fractured skull. And pieces of his skull are lodged in his brain. In and out of a coma, he tries to fight it, but it's just too much for his little body to handle. Roberta goes to bury her little boy, surrounded by women who know exactly how she feels. Inside of our safe house, she comes to know who Jesus is. She's so excited to have the opportunity to profess that faith that she goes beside Betty and also decides that she too wants to be baptized in the faith. When I look at Roberta, I think about Joseph in the prison in Genesis 39, how after everything that he's been through, he still does the will of God. After everything that's happened to, them, happened to him, he's still able to see God's love. After the way that everyone has treated him and being sold into slavery himself, he still finds a way to be God's hands and feet to those that he brings into his path. He helps the cupbearer and the baker and even Pharaoh himself. And we see Roberta doing the same thing. When she comes into that house, she sees a little baby boy. It's Michael, Nicoletta's baby. And Nicoletta's story will have to wait for another day. But Roberta, upon seeing Michael, decides that she wants to do everything she can, wants to see him also be baptized. Going into an Orthodox church, you have to pay for this. And Nicoletta knows that. Roberta says, I don't want you to have to worry about that. I want to pay for his baptism. I want to pay for the church. I want to pay for the, for the candles. I want to pay for the flowers. Nicoletta says, why do you want to do all of this for my baby? Roberta says, I want to do for yours what I can't do for mine. Those two women side by side walk to the first Orthodox church they come to. The church is so blessed by their story that they decide to cover all of the costs. After days after burying the son of one, they come together to celebrate the birth and baptism of another. This pandemic has been a difficult time. We've been able to see the way that God has worked. You are a part of these stories. We continue our journey as we move from Transylvania, Romania to Italy to call Florence our new home. But I want you to pray for the people that God has brought into our path in Romania I want you to pray for those that he is already ministering to in Italy. Pray for the region as we deal with Ukraine. But I want you to know that each one of these stories are your stories. Because of you, we have been able to minister to the least of these. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. These are your stories. This is what faith promise is. Your participation in the soul story of Anka, of Betty, of Tamea, of Roberta, and the countless others that I can't talk about today. These are your stories. 
because of your faithful giving, from thousands of miles away, you are allowing your brothers and sisters to be the hands and feet of Jesus there. We're just doing what you're doing a little further from home. God bless you. So what is faith promise? Faith promise is a pledge. It's a promise that we make to God that we are going to be in on what he is doing around the world. And so faith promise here at Fairview Village is an opportunity for us to make that pledge or promise that we don't know where the funds are going to come from, but we're going to go out on faith. We're going to make a pledge, a promise on faith that God will use us and provide the opportunity for us to give. So on your seat here is a card. I'd like for you to pick that up and take a look at it. And if you're at home watching on our live stream, you can go to the church app or the website under Faith Promise and take a look at these options that are on this card are also there. And you can see that there are a different ways that you can set up your pledge. And I would encourage you today, church, I would encourage you to think about this and to pray about this. More than ever, we need to engage, not just as a local church and our ministries here, and they're listed here, but also globally. More than ever today, we need to engage and be a part of this. So I would encourage you today to fill this out. You can drop it in the offering baskets as they pass by, or you can drop it out at any of our kiosks here. And again, on live stream, you can use the app and the church website to fill out your pledge and to make that commitment. God bless you. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be a part of what you're doing around the world. We are here in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, but today we've been reminded that we're also in Romania, we're in Italy, we're in Israel, we're in the Dominican Republic. We are places that some of us have never been to physically, but we can join together as the body of Christ and keep encouraging and lifting up. And through this support of Faith Promise, we can do so much more together than we could ever do alone. We thank you and we praise you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.